Okay, welcome back for uh, the panel discussion. So, um, thank you very much to be all back. I think that uh, obviously we were absolutely right. Deborah and I, when we decided to call this uh, uh, effort Reflect, because that's exactly what has happened. And uh, I really would like to thank very much Rada and the Marjorie, who is quietly sitting in the back, for the fantastic uh, analysis they've done and which provide a lot of food for thought. So um, the fact of reflecting on data is, I think, something which is extremely important and uh, obviously what we have seen over an hour, presentation uh, by Rada uh, of the results, is really a good sense of uh, how it is important to give second life to data and really, you know, try to again exhaust the data to try and see what they can tell us, which can be important for, for the work. So we have decided with Deborah that we have a panel discussion so that to give the possibility to uh, the various PIs of the trials and uh, as well as those who did uh, the meta-analysis, rather to comment and uh, discuss further and then for you, the audience, to be able to uh, uh, ask them questions. So we start with questions to the panel and then after that we'll open up to the whole audience uh, for questions. So I will first start asking each of them if they can introduce themselves uh, briefly, and then we can start the question. So we'll start uh, with Dave at the end, please. If you can introduce yourself, and then others do it. Uh, good morning, uh, Dave Herman. I'm with Certera and BMGF, and uh, was very excited to see some of the new information coming out. So some of this is brand new to, to a number of us, but very exciting. Good morning. Um, I am Payam Nahid at University of Calif California, San Francisco. I work with the TB Trials <coughs> Consortium. Uh, good morning. I'm Catherine Fielding, a statistician at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And um, I was very much responsible for the original athlete up analyses. Rada Savic, who's here, sir? Hello, I'm Amina Jindani from St. George's University of London, and I was the chief investigator on the Rifkin trial. Um, good morning, my name is Patrick Phillips. I work at the MRC Clinical Trials Unit in London. Um, I'm a statistician. I was involved in both the REMOX and the Rifkin trials. Okay, many thanks. And uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Chris Olienart, and I'm working at the World Health Organization at the Global TB Program, where I'm the team leader, team leader of uh, a group entitled Research for TB Elimination. And for full disclosure, uh, I was uh, initially the PI of the offload of trial when I was working in uh, uh, in, uh, in Africa, in Senegal, with the French Institute de Recherche pour le Développement, which is Institute for Research and Development. So, thank you very much. So, we have the PIs of uh, the three trials, and then Rada, who made the, uh, the meta-analysis. So, I, I would first start by asking each of you, and uh, I will again start from the end of the panel. So, Dave, uh, if you can provide, as opening discussion, one or two messages, uh, which you think are key from your perspective on the main findings of the meta-analysis that Radha showed to us, as well as one potential limitation you see to this exercise. Right, so first, okay, this one's working. Uh, I, I have to say that the amount of work that went in, into this analysis uh, is, is extraordinary. And, and so, so my hat's off to, to Radha and, and Marjorie and, and her team. Uh, to, to CPATH and, and CPTR for uh, continuing to push the, the data and to the, the PIs and the, and the statisticians for doing all the uh, discussion around the data and, and reconciling questions around data. So thank you all for just a tremendous effort. Uh, one, of, one of the key things that, that I took away from, uh, from this work isn't so much of, of the discovery of new factors that we think are important in TB. I think if we did a poll of this group, many of us would have put those factors on the list. The thing that's different now is we've got a pretty good estimate, quantitative estimate, of the impact of these factors, not only in a univariate fashion, but multivariate fashion. And so that's of interest in and of itself, to have these quantitative factors. But the real value is what comes next, and that's the application of the model two important questions to TB drug developers. One of them being trial design, 
uh, the other being, uh, you know, Christian, certainly things that you're interested in around policy and, and how might one approach these things. And this model that's now been developed puts you in a good position to simulate, to explore, to do what ifs uh, using this uh, multivariate uh, uh, proportional hazard uh, type model. Uh, caveats, it would have been, uh, you know, real nice to have consistent uh, uh, data across all, to have full safety uh, data. But, you know, these studies were run some time ago, before the CDISC standard for TB existed. Uh, and so, so perhaps this now, you know, rings the bell to, for us to, to rethink or, or review uh, and, and add on to the existing CDISC standard uh, so that uh, as we move forward, it makes it uh, uh, easier to do the, uh, these types of pooled analysis. Thank you very much, Dave. I, I think that uh, on your last point, and we'll have the opportunity later in the discussion to discuss about that, but I think it's very true this uh, trial where I started in uh, early 2000, uh, 2001 was for Flatub, and then the first patients were registered, were included in the trial single round 2003. So it was before the CDs, and it was, at the time there was not even consideration of uh, standardizing data set uh, across trials. I mean, the exigence was to have trials registered already, which uh, uh, was done, but not about uh, the standardization of data. So your point is taken, and I think it's important to come back later in this discussion about the lessons learned and uh, for the future. So thanks a lot, very good. Uh, Payam, uh, on your own perspective, uh, what are the one or two key messages you sure. draw from this analysis and which uh, uh, limitation would see uh, that would somehow limit the generalizability of the findings? Sure, I mean, I think <coughs> the uh, globally thinking about this, um, I'm reminded of the New England Journal series on data sharing and one of the titles of uh, one of the opinion pieces was data sharing is the juice, juice worth the squeeze. And I think this effort has shown that it is. Um, it's it's in immensely informative with rich um, uh, data and results that come from it. So I think it underscores what uh, Dave was saying in regard to um, moving the TB research community, trials community forward in thinking about um, really h homing in on the commonalities we want in trials, the variables we want co collected, how they're collected, how they're defined, so that this sort of data sharing experiment can, can be done more effectively in the future. I mean, we're, many have commented that the TB research community is in some ways ahead of other, other s sort of field disease arenas in, in, the, in particular related to data sharing um, with the effort um, of uh, the uh, TB Reflect being one, one key example. <clears throat> and I think we should push ourselves to even go further. Um, let's come to consensus on this. <laughs> what is the outcome uh, for our clinical trials that we can all agree to so that they're not different across three trials. Um, have we finally settled the debate over liquid versus solid? Um, you know, can, can we come up with some more consistency and commonality? Because it just makes the analyses and meta-analyses that come from it in the future more powerful, more easily interpretable. Okay, but let, let me be push you a little bit, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, you've been leading the ATS uh, uh, guidelines uh, revision recently. Um, would these results being available to you before the revision, would have it changed the way you would have uh, proposed to look at the effect of standard treatment, um, the effect of using the standard treatment for tuberculosis? Would, us, would that have raised questions to you? Well, um, this was uh, something we debated at, at great length, both at the ATS and CDC IDSA guidelines and also at the WHO guidelines where um, the, the document is still under review, so um, we can't comment, but they do have, a, uh, uh, they, they did explore the four-month fluoroquinolone regimens. Um, and I think the answer is yes, of course. I mean, meta-analyses um, are the basis of the grade methodology um, that, that allows us to make some, some recommendations and um, the certainty in the evidence uh, is graded as many of you have come to learn in, in low certainty versus moderate or high certainty. Um, 
we did not have access to these data at the time. And as you might recall, I tried several times to get access to the data for the, for the guidelines themselves. Uh, and I, now that I see the data, I think that it would have informed us in the way we um, uh, articulated our, our uh, recommendations for, for the guidelines. That, you pressed me quite a bit there. So. <laughs> <laughs> Can I pause? Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what panel discussion is. So. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, Catherine, you were involved, uh, I mean, from the start in the off uh, uh trial. I mean, you, you've been designing the statistical analytic plan of the trial, and uh, you've been following up uh, all the process of uh, this meta-analysis. So, what, what would you because you were deeply involved in the trial, what would you take from uh, this meta-analysis uh, as a key message, and wh what would you reflect in terms of, uh, you would have known this information would have, would have changed in the way you devised the statistical analytic plan of the Oflotop trial. Okay, all right. Um, so well, maybe, maybe one comment about the analysis plan, and um, we did have sort of ad hoc discussions with Andrew and Philip, um, I'm sorry, Patrick, uh, uh, many times um, about sort of the commonality of our plans across the, certainly across Remarks and, uh, and off Tub. So um, I realize there are differences in terms of the endpoints, but um, we, we attempt to try and, um, and have some similarities to those plans. Um, but ultimately, um, because the data were slightly different, that ended up being something somewhat different in some of the, um, of the outcomes. Um, I think adherence is interesting, um, just to just the new data that, that Rada presented um, earlier on today. I think it's fascinating, particularly even in the six-month analysis, uh, six-month regimen, um, and looking at adherence um, is, is absolutely fascinating. And I think, um, for me, better data collection on adherence is, is essential in, in trials where DOT is not is not standard. And um, I think. Uh, I think even, even with the data we have collected, I think Wada's analysis shows very nicely a, a, a dose response in terms of doses taken. But I think those data would be, um, better data collection on that would be um, much more important. And I think that would be uh, sort of going on from one of Rada's points about how you then define what your per protocol population is based on that, I think is interesting. Um, I think one point that um, Rada, mentioned very briefly and those and those analyses are ongoing is the PK data which I think is is fascinating and in this meta-analysis um, how we go about doing um, incorporating PK data in the in those and those um, multivariable models I think is really interesting from a statistical viewpoint um, and you know requiring uh, imputation and I think that's going to be fascinating when we see those data very good Thank you very much. Um, I will. I will jump. Yeah, I, I will jump you absolutely. I think that would be interesting to have others view. So, Amina, yourself, if you could, uh, I'm, I'm sure you discovered this uh, most of this data this morning. So, what what would you what you uh, retain on your own perspective the key messages of this meta analysis? Yeah, as I was looking at Rada presenting these wonderful, elegant analyses, I was thinking to myself. What is the probability of three such similar trials being done at roughly the same time in order to be able to have such a data mass? Um, Catherine referred to Remoxen and Offlo Talbot that done some collaboration. Rifikun was very much the Cinderella with these two ugly sisters. Uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But I, I was just very happy that the Rifikun data was able to <coughs> contribute to these analyses in, in such a way. Uh, and the thought that I take away with me is that really we should be much more collaborative and not competitive. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So Patrick, the same questions to you about the... I mean, trying really to go into the depth of the data that yeah, you've been presented. Yeah. What you yeah, so I mean, I, I, I think uh, uh, some of you will know the paper by Wallace Fox in 1989 called With a, With a Short Course Chemotherapy. It's a very nice read if you want to read it, 1989, where he, was, he uh, ran the MRC units, um, and it's his sort of retirement 
a monologue uh, when, when, he, when he retired and actually raised many of these issues. But what he pointed out was that um, it was very clear even back then that uh, around 80% of patients could be cured with four months of the standard regimen. And the challenge has always been to identify those 80% of patients. Um, and it, it's really exciting that we're, we're beginning to get a handle on uh, factors that can identify those patients that can be cured with short durations of even standard therapy. Um, so I think that's one of the main messages that, um, and I suppose for, for this group here, that of course we need new drugs, of course we need new regimens, but a, a very, um, I think what this is showing us and is, is, is giving an indication that there are major gains to be had um, with better use of the current drugs, um, uh, which could be used alongside new drugs, which could be um, perhaps um, more, more uh, stratified medicine, thinking about stratifying um, durations. Maybe there are populations of patients who need more than six months of treatment, um, as well as populations of patients who need less than six months of treatment or could get away with less than six months of treatment. Um, of course, uh, rather, uh, we had an, uh, an introduction to some of the pharmacokinetic analyses at the end there, indicating the importance of rifampicin and the importance of the, of the, the um, AUC and the CMAX of rifampicin, indicating that perhaps there's opportunities to get more more juice out of the current drugs as well by looking at, looking at higher doses. Um, I, think, I think these are the, some of the key messages. Um, around the collaboration one, if I can just talk about that because that's come up in the panel a lot, it's very easy for us to say, yes, we need to collaborate better, and we, of course, we do. I, I think I would agree with Catherine that in many ways the analyses plans of these three trials were, were actually quite similar. Um, Catherine was, on the de was an independent member of the Data Monitoring Committee for Remox and, and, and Rifquin, and actually, Andrew was on the data monitoring committee for the Offertub trial. Um, all trials use the same margin of non inferiority. There was a lot of overlap between the trials, and there was a lot of discussion between Catherine and Andrew about trying to bring these three trials together. Um, and still, it was challenging. <laughs> so um, I, I just I think that uh, one of the challenges with with a, with a meta analysis on, on the data sharing side of things is is understanding the data. Um, and I've seen a lot of emails back and forth in the last few months understanding the data. Um, one of the issues that Rada alluded to was that the coding of the smear grading was different in the three different trials. And we actually only established that in the last few months. And it required a, a recoding of, of, the, of some of the data. So prior to that, the data didn't make any sense because there was different coding between the three trials. It's, it's small things like that which I think perhaps we underestimate and require a lot of work in understanding the data. And I do think that probably the, the primary outcome is, is probably closer than perhaps Perhaps rather, is it, so we need, we, need, we need to discuss this a bit more about making, making that clear. Um, so certainly there are challenges there in bringing data together. And I would very much echo Pyam's points about, you know, particularly in, in the TB Alliance, we've done a lot of phase two and phase three trials in, in recent years. There's a lot of learning there. And I think we are in a place where we could, uh, this community could come together and make some consensus about what a three, phase three endpoint should be. Um, obviously also in TBTC study 31. So I... So you, you're already leading to the, the next question. In fact, I was envisaging to, to ask you. So I, I think that's important. Based on the data, Patrick, that uh, we've seen, uh, one of your key messages is that we should really rethink the way we are uh, capturing the outcome of, uh, of uh, trial, um, especially phase three trials. So based on, on the uh, meta results, what, what would you what would you propose in terms of uh, track of reflection for what would be the ideal uh, endpoints that we should consider, especially to look at the fact that we have to move from phase two trials to phase three trials? Which endpoint could we seize at the phase two level that would really, you know, embark us in a, in a phase three trial that is being worth being conducted? I mean, what is surprising is that these three uh, um, colonial shortening trials uh, we are somehow built about, over the fact that there was a possibility to shorten TB treatment, and that was based on a series, a, a, a case series from, from India, published by the Tobacco Disease Research Center in Chennai. And there were just some patient series, limited patient series, I think it was about 50 patients in each of the series. And they were trying some combination, and one of them showed, uh, um, I think, a 9% relapse rate compared to others which were 12 or 14 or 6%, 6 so something which looked interesting. So then the idea came of having the trial and uh, the Oflotub uh, has been set in two phases and uh, 
The first one, there's a paper published by uh, Roxana, who is in, in, uh, in the audience, looked at uh, the sputal cultural conversion at two months, uh, looking at uh, quinolone-containing regimens versus the standard of care. And the conclusion of the two months cultural conversion was that there was a significant difference in terms of uh, uh, speed, in terms of uh, slope of cultural conversion, the CFU count uh, decline, when you were adding uh, quinolone, uh, moxiflux, uh, moxifloxacin or gatifloxacin compared to ethambutol or even ofloxacin. And this has been taken as a further uh, justification about conducting the four months trial. Yet the four months trial didn't uh, translate uh, this uh, impression we had from the two months cultural conversion that there will be uh, achieving you know, a uh, non-relapsing cure after four months. So obviously there was a here type of uh, a discrepancy between what was hoped from the two-month cultural conversion and what has been shown, which tells a lot, I think, in terms of uh, what the two-month cultural conversion is depending on, on the, is not, or is or is not depending on the regimen and what it can be used for the uh, bringing new uh, future trials from the phase two to the phase three. And I think that's the, the data from, uh, from RADA really question that, that, uh, that, uh, uh, that use of the two months cultural conversion. So what would you from that propose in terms of uh, future trial design? So that was, that was in quite terms a long, of end point, yeah. In terms of that's quite a long question. I, I suppose I would push back on that, Christian. I would suggest that actually this analysis doesn't really um, touch on the questions around what endpoint we should use for a phase two trial. Um, and I think the main messages are about the, the, baseline covictus, uh, the baseline covariates. And certainly, I think it shows the importance of some of the on-treatment response as predicting outcome. I think it's a very, very different question about what, what endpoint we should use in, in phase two trials. And I would be reluctant to, to, to move into that discussion here. OK. But I can let other people do if they want to. But I would be happy to have others' view in the panel. So, so this is a bit of a tricky issue, as, as you know, Christian. So if we go back to the work that, that Bob did, looking at, at the cumulative uh, historic data on uh, summary level data from the literature, there was a, a very nice relationship between two-month conversion, uh, culture conversion, regimen duration, and durable cure. Very, very nice relationship, uh, very interesting paper. Uh, and, and gave us some, some hope that uh, uh, one could actually use uh, two-month culture conversion data from a phase two study to predict forward. Uh, so so we, t we took that to, to be quite interesting and, and then looked at the results from the, the three studies that we've been talking about and the concordance between what the model uh, that Bob had published some years ago uh, and the observations from the summary level data at the level of the treatment arms uh, from the two-month conversion uh, regimen duration and outcome were very concordant. It, it's, it's just a, a very uh, uh, nice relationship, holds up uh, quite well. Rada made the point, you know, if you want to then look at an individual and think of a two-month conversion as a binary test mm -hmm. for uh, success or failure in terms of treatment, that's a much uh, higher hurdle, a much more difficult thing to do. But I think at the level of the regimen, a two-month culture conversion, uh, regimen duration, and durable cure, there's a pretty nice relationship there. The challenge is we run 30, 40, 50 patient phase two studies, which leads to a lot of uncertainty in that two-month culture conversion rate. And so moving toward uh, time to positivities and, and, mm -hmm. and uh, more quantitative endpoints rather than the binary outcome, yes, you converted or you didn't, is kind of the, the, the next step that, that we need to take. Unfortunately, with this data set, we, we don't have that kind of uh, rich uh, culture conversion data uh, across all three trials. Uh, so that's a direction for us to, to think through. Thank you. No, that's, that's very clear. Thank you very much. So, um, but to continue the, the discussion then, based on the findings from this uh, meta-analysis, and I, I would like I mean, any from the panel, uh, what do you think uh, these findings would translate into optimizing uh, the design of future trial? 
what, uh, what is your feeling in terms of uh, uh, what you can take from this uh, meta-analysis that could influence and inform the design of future trial of shortening uh, treatment regimen? And again, that's open, you know, in between you to, uh, yes. Is this on? I can, that's an easier question to answer. Um, I, I think there's a number of implications, um, and I think it depends very much on, on the objective of a regimen that's in development. Um, one approach would be to think about stratified medicine, to think about um, testing different durations of a regimen in different subsets of patients in order to get an overall non-inferiority across, across the, the patient population. Um, that's quite a... Um, that, that's a more complicated route, and I think one would need a great deal of confidence in the, the uh, biomarkers that might be used to stratify patients in order to take that approach. Um, I think another a very simple way is to, is to think about, um, particularly in middle development, uh, enriching trials for patients that are more likely to relapse, um, and then really looking in the hardest to treat patients and looking to see whether these new regimens are really going to reduce relapse rates. And you could get away, if you take a hard-to-treat population, where you would expect the relapse rates, perhaps with, drug set, with um, the standard regimen, to be 20%, 25%, you have much higher power to look at differences, and you could get away with a, a much smaller sort of phase two, like, almost like a mini phase three trial. Um, and then I, I would imagine that if you could show benefit with a short, with, or non-inferiority with a shorter regimen, ideally benefit, in a very difficult to treat population, um, it wouldn't be too implausible to then expand those results to a, to a wider population. So I think it could change um, sort of d a development pathway potentially for regimens. That, that's interesting. So you would propose to carry out trials in different types of populations? So I, th I think that could be one learning from this, and I think, I think one could consider that. Um, look, enriching, particularly in middle development when, when trials are fairly small, enriching for patients that are harder to treat. Um, and if a regimen isn't going to um, provide benefit in this population, it's unlikely to do so across the, across the wider patient population. That could be an approach. Thank you. Any other opinion? Yes? I am. I mean, I'm straddling both the clinical trials world and the clinical guide, guidelines world. Um, and, you know, it, it's interesting, as, as I was listening to Rada's uh, um, excellent talk, I was reflecting on how practice guidelines already um, have individualization as part of them. And we, we, we already, even without the practice guidelines, those who are in clinic know that when you have an end of treatment x-ray that shows there remain uh, a cavity remains or there's quite a lot of consolidation left, you would, uh, or zone five, uh, you know, <laughs> categorization, you would extend treatment. Um, <clears throat> and similarly, we've, we've talked about um, cavitation at baseline. So clinically, this gets done. And I, I was just sort of trying to do the thought exercise around how one incorporates the, that individualization into trials. Um, we've, we've approached our trials with a one-size-fits-all strategy, but clinically and programmatically, the, there's, there is some individualization already. And I think some discussion, at, at least in the US, I'm sp you know, in North American, European, um, and you know, I think these kinds of data press me to think a little bit more about whether we want to be developing regimens that speak to TB programs that for decades have wanted um, a standard regimen for everyone? Or do we want to press the envelope a bit and, and come up with um, clinical trial designs that are assessing strategies that involve various risk strata of patients and how well they'll do? Um, it makes for a really complicated thought exercise, but I think it's a discussion we ought to have. It's, a, it's time for it. Absolutely. Uh, Dave, you wanted to comment? Right. There's what you would do in the context of a clinical development program, a regimen development program, and then there's the results that one would take out of a program like that and then apply it to, to policy and clinical practice. So one of the things we need to be careful of is if we've got a really good new regimen, three months, three drugs, works really well across all of these groups, if we start with this stratification out of the gate for the development programs, you don't learn that. You don't study the hard to treat patients in the shorter groups. And, and so you have to be careful on, on how you uh, think about uh, running your clinical development program where I think you want to learn about the hard to treat, the, the, the easier to treat, short regimen, long regimen, so that you can then make good decisions coming out of a development program like that for policy. 
mean, I, I'd agree. I think, but Patrick, just to echo your point, I mean, the enrichment concept would be suitable for selected phases, if you will, or even perhaps um, half of a phase. <laughs> so uh, at, at some point, the regimens have to be tested w in, a, in a context wherein the real world needs them um, to be used. So, but that doesn't, I just think we can be more innovative in the various m phases of middle development to think about how this kind of, um, these kinds of markers might, might help uh, stratify risk and individualize things a bit. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe I should uh, also comment. Um, um, few things we haven't showed you is that actually we also have done all of these analyses trying to predict um, culture, month two culture status and month four culture status. And you know, it's really the same set of uh, story comes in. So the patients who will likely uh, be culture to month two culture positive and month four culture positive are the usual suspects. So, um, uh, but however, I think what we really learned from my point of view, I think we have a great insight how to cure more patients and with, with what we have right now and how we can do that efficiently. So from that point of view, I think um, that, is, that, is, that, is, that is one learning. Um, but going back to the what is a good marker for phase three based on these analysis, these analysis, none of these are uh, very good at predicting individual relapse. But I think my biggest learning, we will have a very good phase two uh, endpoint once when actually that phase two point is able to predict individu individual relapse very well. And I think we just, we, we, we've got to look for those, which means really in phase three trials, if we, if we had more candidate biomarkers for early treatment response and if we link those with the relapse, then we would have come up with a you know, proposal uh, clinical phase two trial endpoint, but as it is now, none of these, uh, I don't think it's very good to predict individual um, rel relapse, and that will be the best clinical, um, phase two clinical endpoint. Can, can yes, I just say, um, for a while I had the privilege of working with the Medical Research Council under Wallace Box and Dana Mitchison. Please speak more loudly. A little bit closer. Um, okay. Yes. Uh, as I said, I had a, the privilege of working with the Medical Research Council under Wallace Fox and Denny Mitchison, and, and, who, who, and we missed them. Uh, classically, they didn't do trials for the fun of it. They did trials so they could identify regimens which they could then take to national programs and, and be able to use them, a, a blanket regimen for the whole population. Now, this idea of individualization is very good. Uh, if it can be done. But I suggest to you that out there, uh, we're still a very, very long way mm. um, from individualizing treatment for TB patients. And the majority of our patients are out there. Absolutely, uh, you're right. So I think that we should retain this notion of the hard to treat population as being extremely indicative for the sake of running the trial and understanding the response uh, that we observe in the trial. Yet it is much too early to try to go beyond that and into uh, reconsidering the policy and practice. I, I would fully agree with you. But uh, I think that's, that's not important to say it shouldn't be done because something may come out of it. You know, the, yeah. the, it, it should be done. But the, <clears throat> the, the wider uh, view should be a blanket regimen that can be mm. given across the population. I agree. Thank you very much. So to, to continue uh, uh, on the discussion on this. Uh, on the way to try and understand better, um, you mentioned rather the issue about biomarkers and we all here agree about the fact that we do need uh, better biomarkers and to try and um, devise or predict as much as possible the potential outcome of treatment, etc. And there is a huge effort being done by CPTR on that level. So I will leave um, Deborah to comment uh, upon that later. But you came with these interesting <coughs> findings rather in this analysis about uh, the effect of uh, smear uh, positiveness from one to three as being a major uh, factor of uh, uh, unfavorable or favorable outcome. So <clears throat> I think that's interesting. I mean, to my view, it's one of the first time it is really being shown this way. So this, does it tell us something about uh, the need for us to have a, a better quantitative assessment of the bacterial load uh, in the patients to try and devise uh, the, or predict about treatment outcome? 
Yeah, well, um, I've shown you results using like the common set of predictors, and this is what we had across different trials. Um, having said that, these were definitely not the best thing we can use out there. Um, and SMEAR is really uh, was common, but it's, in the way we've seen it, it's really an indicator of uh, bacterial load and higher SMEAR grade should be associated with more disease. Um, I would have loved if we had more like a time to positivity or gene expert PCR values or even like CFU counts or something that is more quantitative because that would definitely um, sink even more in the analysis. It would get even finer uh, refinement, but I think that is very clear message, you know, some me baseline measurement of bacterial, um, bacterial load and severity of disease is, is just simply a must. Uh, and either it can be done from the chest x-ray by different scoring systems or, or um, different culture methods, but that would be probably the easiest way to, if you we, if we talk about treatment stratification, um, and later on when we treat about choice of different regimens, I know that we do want to have one regimen for all, but there will be regimens that penetrate much, much better into cavities, which will be more adequate for patients with cavities. So we're hoping to have choice, and once you have a choice, you want to be able to recommend to your patients the best option uh, in a simple way. So um, having said that, so baseline, I would say, quantification of the disease and probably some measurement from chest x-ray would be the, the, the most practical, maybe uh, easily roll out and uh, useful one. Okay, so this is something that we can recommend, you know, in terms of uh, the need to standardize data in future trials based, based on that. Yeah. And that comes back to the issue which was raised by many of you at the beginning about the need from now on to really make sure that we have standardization of data being collected into trials. And, and I think just as a follow-up, I mean, there's a lot of data out there, and that's something what we've been thinking. We should just actually look how the smear 1+, plus, 2+, plus, 3+, plus, <coughs> how they correlate with baseline TTPs and, uh, and gene expert and, and other type of from other trials. Because there's a lot of data out there, and that can also already give us some indication if we would like to use this quantitative result from these trials, how that would translate if you do have gene expert PCR value, the baseline, uh, how informative that to you, because people did come to us asking, what if I have gene expert, how do, how do I make my cutoff? Or what if I have TTP, how do I make my cutoff? So we don't have the guidance, but that's the easy, easy, easier thing to do because there's plenty of data out there. Thank you very much. Yes, Brian. Hey, Rada, I have a question for you. Um, so many in the TB trials community are looking more and more towards time to stable culture conversion um, in place of a dichotomous single time point. So those data, are presumably inter available through these three trials? Is that something that you might explore? Have you already made some decisions about it? Um, so that is, um, that was one of the first questions when we done analysis because that would be potential proxy instead of month two culture conversion, like an easier one, uh, the one that we would all could relate to. Um, it is, uh, we have to derive it and uh, it, derivation is very dependent on the schedule of cultures because cultures are sometimes collected every two weeks. So, so that is the trouble with this derived time to stable culture conversion because you have to sample many times in order to actually get the right value. So there's a lot of bias, bias in it. But having said that, just from the analysis point of view, um, binary out from zero one is terrible to work with and we should move away from it. It's just uh, otherwise we will, have, we will need these trials that require a thousand and thousand patients. So time to stable culture and conversion, at least within our um, CDC work, was a very useful one and very strong and predictive one in terms of finding what you're really after, like what is the optimal dose, what are the high-risk patients, and so on. So in general, I would like to see that more, but on the, on the other hand, it's very challenging to get precise time to culture conversion because of sampling scheme. So that is a trade-off. Yeah. Thank you very much. So it's, it's fascinating, and there are a lot of questions uh, which could be still asked, and I had a series, but I think that maybe it would be good to open to the audience the, the discussion. So I would like to know whether there is uh, willingness from anybody of you to ask a question to the panel. So we start with, uh, okay, Klaus. Yeah, and Klaus Romero with the Critical Path Institute. Just uh, a clarifying comment before making the, asking the question. The, the data management effort, as, as Rada indicated and Dave indicated, is still ongoing, and so, Regarding, for example, the safety uh, data, we, we know that, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Remox did actually code for adverse events. Those were just part of a separate file, and now we're transferring those files um, to begin the data management effort on those and complete the and support the, the safety analysis. 
the the question uh, that I had, and oh, by the way, the this discussion about face two to face three translation. Stay tuned for the afternoon session. Uh, Nasi is going to present some some work on that based on on the data platform that we generate for phase two studies. Um, but the question that I had for the panel uh, was if if you could elaborate a little bit more on on the on the notion that that Rada just mentioned about moving away from these. Uh, contrived, derived binary endpoints and, and look at more, more longitudinal uh, type uh, biomarkers or outcome measures that, that could be, could give you more of a, of a realistic, close to real time estimates of what's going on with treatment response across the studies and how that could potentially translate into transforming the thinking and incorporating those for adaptive trial designs. Rada, would you like to... Uh... Well, yeah, I can... Um, I've, I've, we've done um, um, some thinking around that and, and, and some analysis around that. I think in general, um, in the phase, f phase 2B, we often ask the question if our regimen is better in standard care, and often what we're trying to do also um, choose the right dose, right? We're doing those ranging studies. Um, and um, in, again, from the analysis point of view, um, <coughs> if you do binary zero one analysis, you're very likely that you're going to pick up the, the wrong dose. Not very likely, but you're likely because just identifying nice exposure response is um, very challenging uh, when you have a binary outcome. And it's much easier identifiable if you do have longitudinal analysis. For example, if you're working with time to stable conversion is better than working with MAN2 culture conversion. If you're working with longitudinal time to positivity, um, uh, likelihood that you will actually pick up the right dose and make your conclusions is higher with a smaller sample size. And we've done some more analysis using longitudinal gene expert, again, as a longitudinal and quantitative measurement, and again, it's the same. Um, it is just, um, it is more suitable, whatever we have, and I'm sure we will not be making wrong conclusion if we use either time to positivity gene expert or time to stable conversion to make our inferences from phase two trial, and those inferences will probably be likely more closer to true on, than if we just use MAN2 culture conversion. And the reason is really simple, because MAN2 culture conversion is just one measurement out of many that you use to actually understand the, 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 the drug response. And, um, yeah, so, so, so having said that, I think uh, we can just transition towards anything like a more quantity that we have in place to make inferences about comparisons of the regimens. Very good, thank you. Uh, I just noticed that there are quite a lot, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's true, it's, no, no, but that's good, that's good, but we are a lot of people here, but uh, we know each other well for many years, but there are new faces, etc. So I just propose everybody who comes to speak to present him or herself rapidly and ask a question. Uh, yes, Bob Wallace, uh, Orem Institute. Um, I, I totally agree with the comments about you know, wanting to uh, approach TB treatment in a personalized way and in a quantitative way. Um, and I, I was drawn to the two-month data um, question because of the wealth of information about that time point, not because it was the best <laughs> marker that there was. But I'm very surprised in the application uh, of two-month data to the design of clinical trials in as much as I don't understand how people picked four months. Um, the fact that two-month culture conversion is a little bit better um, with moxifloxacin, for example, doesn't tell you anything about the transition from a, a six-month regimen to a four-month regimen, and I'm very surprised that in advance of these trials, except for our work, that no one said, is the improvement that you see with adding moxie, is it enough to get you to four months? I, I you know, that, that discussion was, was missing. Um, but not that there's a problem with the marker, mm -hmm. it's a problem with the, the thinking that goes into the trials. I, I, I so I, uh, I it's just Would my anybody point. wants to respond <laughs> to Bob's <laughs> statement? I am? In response to your question, Bob, about why wasn't there more deliberation about this, um, I, th I think there was. I think the TB Trials Consortium was one network um, that decided that the, the, um, there wasn't enough of a signal there for, for, for it yeah. to be worth mm -hmm. to move to phase three. So that's part of it. Um, the whole two-month culture conversion thing is, frankly, 
it, it, it's a little bit of a Rubik's cube to me in that I, it feel, I feel like you've solved it. Um, maybe you know how to do a Rubik's cube, but I don't still. I've tried many times. It makes it hard for, it, for me to teach my children how to do it because I don't know how to do it. Um, but I, I really, I still struggle with it because at the end of the day, what, what I feel it tells us is if you've got 100% conversion, great, go for it. If you've got less than that, yes, I, I, maybe I not. That's, and I maybe that's, that's, right. that's all there is to say about the two-month yeah. culture. Yeah. So um, I, I, no, I, I, that, that's fine. I actually have just one more quick comment about... Um, a combined endpoint with deaths and, uh, um, and recurrences. A and I think this is particularly a problem for HIV-positive subjects. Uh, in the Kurbatova uh, study, the, the, the cohort study in MDR-TB, they reported also this combined endpoint failure and death, but they also analyzed separately mm -hmm. the, the two outcomes. And they were quite different if you looked at HIV-positive and HIV-negative. Um, the HIV negative subjects had the same rate of failure, but a several fold increased rate of death I I during the follow up period. And it turns out, you know, these patients were, s were treated from 2000 to 2005 to 2008 or thereabouts uh, in far flung parts of the world. A and it's quite clear to me, there's no mention about the HIV treatment of these patients. Um, but, but looking closely at the fine print, they probably didn't receive what we would consider adequate HIV treatment by, by in, in any means. Um, and, that prob and so the deaths probably were AIDS related and not necessarily TB related. So I would be very cautious in looking at the data from these trials uh, unless we can ascertain, you know, what was the HIV treatment adequate or not. Uh, point is taken by Catherine, you want to uh, respond well, to that? Yeah. Well, yeah, maybe then, just uh, to clarify that um, that death post the end of treatment was not included as an endpoint um, and unless there was evidence of TB before the death. So we looked at clinical uh, data from that. Um, and in the Ofletov study, we, um, as, as Rada mentioned, we did include people who were uh, with HIV, um, but um, I'm going to try and remind myself, and maybe uh, Christian can remind, okay, uh -huh. that we, we excluded people um, when they started ART, so we can't say much about yes. HIV in these trials, as Rod mentioned. I'll, I'll just Thank you, Andrew, please. Andy Vernon, CDC. I'll just second the point about the fact that we need to clean up each of these variables as much as we can. HIV is just one example. Uh, it's an important one. I think the recommendations about when to start TB therapy are greatly confounded by absence of data on which patients were getting ART and who had MD MDR, and that we have a guideline that may not be optimal. Um, the, the, uh, uh, it applies in the studies that we, Rada has just talked about with regard to recurrence, because we've confounded, we confound relapse and reinfection in that group. And so that's one of the recommendations that we really need to clean up. I was thinking in this regard about the smear and, and uh, culture during therapy. Those are very muddy data points because they, they suck in the effect of pharmacokinetics, the effect of the MIC, the effect of adherence, and they tell you, all those factors and whatever else was present uh, at baseline, and you get this result at this point in time. So are you doing well or you're not doing well? But if you include it in a model, you've already drawn part of the power that you could use for those baseline risk factors, for example. And I know there's a trade-off between things we think will be useful and things that we think are important in predicting what outcomes will be. But in the process, we are confounding our ability to assess other outcomes or uh, other, other influences on the outcomes. And uh, b just before you comment uh, in response, I was also thinking about the fact that I don't know that PK doesn't change over time. The PK for a patient who's very ill is probably different from the PK for a patient who's in month five of treatment. and so what the impact of missed doses is in relation to PK at these different points of time is also still unclear. So we just need to be careful uh, in, in the, about the conclusions to which we leap, I think. 
but I'll welcome your thoughts. The last question, last comment is just, or question is, has to do with the difference between duration and adherence, or the separation of those two. We talked about it briefly, but uh, uh, so we have difference between duration and duration and adherence, adherence. because w w we're engaged in a series of trials, m many of us, to try to shorten duration, and that hinges on the ability to really kill all, all the bacilli to, 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 or at least to, to uh, detoxify all the bacilli in a short period of time, and that in turn is an issue of how long can they hold their breath. Um, the adherence piece relates to, uh, well, adherence during intensive phase may be much more important than adherence during continuation phase, but, uh, and how to weigh these together and bring them together in, in, in models is really challenging. So I wonder, I'm sure you have comments on all of that. Yeah, okay, so let me see if I remembered. So first is about the culture. Um, and, and that was actually, Andy, you're, you're very right, because the culture, um, culture results, they already are kind of confounded with some baseline predictors because baseline predictors will already um, be represented in your culture and you will be already treating and you have some part of adherence that gets into the culture. So, um, so that's why we've, we've done um, a lot of analysis, uh, just looking at the baseline only, um, culture only, baseline plus drug, but without culture. And um, basically what I've shown you today was really synthesis that should not change with the main message. But uh, you, you're very right. So culture does pick up and does take away from other predictors, meaning if you don't put culture in there, uh, baseline smear and cavity and uh, drug will, will really go through the roof and we will really overwhelm the, the, the significance and importance over the culture. Um, so that, that is a you know, very um, you know, um, sensitive topic, what you should measure, what you should measure not, but you're right, culture does take a lot of away the power. Um, your second point was before adherence and duration was on, um, was on outcomes. No, was, um, so it's here, I, my brain is full of a lot Just of a stuff. Just a question of w w w how they interact together, because yes, people duration. who are less adherent are liable to need longer duration to complete therapy, and so you've got both together. Yes, so we've looked, so basically, again, this is quite tricky. Again, you have to get rid of all of these patients that do fail um, in the initial phase. So we look at this, what you call recurrence uh, factor, and then clearly um, how the number of pills that you take, how that relates to the, uh, to the duration of your the therapy. And there is, uh, Mandri look into that, and there is a slight correlation, around 0.3. So if you, if you um, like are, and it's positive actually, which means if you go for longer, you're likely to complete your course uh, because you keep going for longer. Um, but, but that is really a tree, and it, you had a comment around PK. I think um, what really the way we want to look at um, is like number of rifampin doses, we want to sum up those drugs and try to see how that relates to duration. But that is a very simplified view because of all the PK, PK things that you brought up. And you know, who knows me here, you know that I'm from ecology and from, from PKPD person. And really like how do you give the drug, IOPK, PK is changing over time. Rifampin PK is very variable. There is out induction going on. There is a DDI going on. There's like a, this really like a, um, a lot of stuff going on that will define your outcome and only if you understand these relationships and how they actually interact together, that will actually, you know, then we will be really doing some really good science, pharmacological science and learning around those. Um, the fact that duration might be beneficial, um, it could be only because even if it's short interruptions, you actually maintain your level above MIC for longer time. So it could be that reason. So there could be a lot of pharmacological factors. Um, so I, and I think definitely there's a trade-off bet in between how high you go in the dose and for how short you can, you can go. So you can't just um, replace these two. And going forward, if there's one thing I think that is going to be really helpful for TB, especially given that as long as we do have HRZE and as long as we do have these drugs with short half-life, is having a detailed, um, a little bit more detailed data on adherence and these patterns and, and just few PK samples, that's all it matters. Like one tube samples um, uh, thoughtfully placed, they're gonna be very helpful to actually give you that full-time course of the drug during six months and to actually get to these questions. Um, I, there was something else you asked, but. 
Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, clarification. I think that for the sake of time, we just take the last three questions. And, yes. Uh, and then we'll uh, close the so, session, please. So I had a question. Uh, first, a great work, a, a very impressive amount of data that was presented there. So um, uh, just to, to, to what people have been saying, which leads to a direct question for, for Dr. Savage here. So I, I, the failure of the four-month regimens did you probe a dose response relationship for the quinolones, right? So, so I'm moving away from the HRZE regimen, right? So was part of the failure, and I don't know whether you have done this or not, was part of that failure uh, also driven by dose? The point being, you know, so PKs and everything, when we measure those, and, and, and I think you are absolutely right, getting a few PK measurements will give you a lot of guide um, uh, the only response we have is changing the dose, right? So, so in, in the end, that's what the program gets. And I'm actually saying this, and I'll just, just to push back, and I'll let you talk on individualization. One of the places where we individualize is with dosing. And I would say it's not that it's hard to individualize. It's just that we don't have a good biomarker. It's not that patients are in rural systems or in places where it's hard to do this. We do this with diabetes and, 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 and insulin in rural patients. As long as we have a measure that we can use to change the dose, right? I mean, in, in the end, that's, that's really the issue, but back to, to dosing. Okay, so uh, fluoroquine, fluoroquine on dosing. So um, uh, we've, uh, I haven't shown you, but clearly we're looking into this. Um, so a few things I think we definitely have seen, from, at least from what I've shown you today, that actually adding fluoroquinolone was beneficial, replacing ethambutol. So that was a good thing. So that really had, um, that is lowering the hazard. And we've seen that in, in different analysis. Um, we've also seen some indication that there is um, exposure response for fluoroquinolones, meaning that higher uh, levels of fluoroquinolones are protective in terms, in terms of favorable outcome, which again raises the question of fluoroquinolone dose that has been used. Uh, that 400 mates may not have um, been enough. Clearly, there's a QT limitation, and there's there's all, a lot of things going on. Um, the reason, uh, other um, aspect of fluoroquinolone with rifampin that um, we haven't discussed, we haven't talked about much, is uh, DDI that is going on between rifampin and, and, and fluoroquinolone, decreasing the uh, fluoroquinolone levels around 30, 40 to 50 percent, which is which is very important. So we might fluoroquinolone, we might have great drug, but it's just uh, so also the metabolism is induced, and you just don't get it to the high level. So I think there is a lot to do with fluoroquinolone um, dose if somebody wants to take that route of testing um, higher uh, moxy dose, uh, 600, 800, there are trials going on, but that really has to be seen in light of safety and QT, um, QT prolongation. And just a comment about individualization, actually, because I'm, I'm putting this um, on the, hmm? oh. optic, exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, and just in, in, even if somebody can think that we can up the moxy dose, and even if you have a DDI, you still, your C maxes will remain, uh, will be higher with higher dose, uh, because you really are changing, what is changing with rifampin is that lower part of the PK curve, which means you will actually be upping your risk for QT prolongation with higher dose, regardless of DDI. Um, and the other thing about individualization certification, I know that I've been pushing for that, and, uh, not, and that's how the concept I've definitely brought in. I don't think, um, I really don't think about like an individual's personal therapy for TB, but some simple levels of certification that are easily implemented, um, and especially with uh, availability of more regimens down the road, I think we, we should be comfortable to be aiming for that. So simple table, like with HIV treatment, we have a lot of different regimens, and uh, I think I'm hoping that we'll get there with TB, and uh, so those guidances we can hope for that can be implemented in the field. Very good. Thank you very much, Radha. So, yes, your turn for the question, please. Uh, my name is Kone Kaniga from Johnson & Johnson Global Public Health. I'd like to apologize for the question because uh, I'm non-statistician. So on behalf of all the non-statisticians <laughs> here, so I'm going to offer this question. Um, I noticed that you use 95% confidence interval in all your analysis. Uh, and it's my 
experience that most of the trial we designed based on 95%. Uh, it was 90% chosen because of the nature of meta-analysis in order to be able to gather the data together or what was the reason behind the choice of the 90% 90 confident interval. And would that give an advantage of one group versus the other uh, compared if you have used 95%? And going forward, if meta-analysis should inform future clinical trial design, would you recommend 95%, 90% <laughs> confident interval to compare two groups particularly involving new drugs? Yeah, I think um, for um, non theroidity tests, we have used 95%. Uh, confidence intervals for performing actual tests, and the reason it might have been in the in the figures that we use 90 is for visualization purposes. Because with 95, it, it, then you, you had a lot. We had a lot of numbers, and there was a lot of going on. So I just wanted to stress. Uh, but whatever was report, reported as significant was really um, using using formal statistical tests as they were done in in, in other three trials. Thank you. So we. So, Next question. very quickly then, my question is also for uh, Radha. My name is Wim van der Velde from the Global TB Cap. Uh, Radha, I've had the pleasure of, of hearing you present uh, in the past on uh, uh, the phase 2C design concept. And um, I'm just wondering if, where indeed we can capture these uh, markers and uh, uh, the data that you have been presenting on now. Um, do you think that in the context of CPTR we should be talking more about phase 2C and defending it, maybe promoting more that, that novel model? Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I, uh, thanks for your question. I think um, given that we don't have any good intermediate endpoints for phase, to go from phase one to phase two, and you know, I'm re repeating a little bit now, but we all know, um, I think really uh, we have to invest heavily um, in few years to, to study a lot of relationships between early treatment response and, and, and recurrence in relapse, and often we suggest this phase 2C as a platform where actually you can start understanding what is really predictive in, in terms of early treatment response of a relapse. And once we found good relationship, that would be a great uh, phase 2B endpoint. So I think phase 2C or smaller phase 3, uh, exploratory phase C, or just following up patients up to uh, maybe six months post-treatment will give us a lot of lot of uh, return for investment if you, if, you, if you put it that way and you know we do call that design phase 2C. Very good. Um, thank you very much. So if there is no other question I think that we come to the end of this session. So uh, I think that we can summarize the, the learnings that we have so far is that uh, obviously we have now the ability to evaluate data, large data sets across uh, various uh, projects, trials, institutions. And uh, obviously it comes as being quite fundamental in terms of uh, maxim maximizing the learning, the information we can have. So I think that's quite a, a positive uh, uh, output of this exercise. And uh, it, it comes to the, the fact that we really need to have consistency in, uh, in data collection across trials. And that is absolutely key to expedite uh, integrated learning. That tells us something important, I think, for what is happening now. There are so many MDR-TB clinical trials which are being carried out in the world uh, with various arms, various combinations. So I think that we should really try and think about the fact that we might have at what point uh, all interest uh, to try and learn more and then make sure that uh, these various trials also have at least key standardized data uh, being collected to uh, plan for future meta-analysis that can be extremely important in terms of learning. So the models that we have uh, seen are intended to evolve and will become even more precise. Uh, we hope to have more detailed data uh, with the chest X-ray readouts, etc. That tells us how much we would need biomarkers. It tells us also, uh, and especially related to the last point of the discussion, how much PK samples are important in clinical trial uh, data collection. And that's also, again, a call for those running trials to always make sure that they include uh, um, sampling of data for PK, uh, PD analysis, and, and I think that is extremely important. So in terms of next step, um, we had uh, an extraordinarily uh, nice description of the data carried out by UCSF, by Rada and Marjorie, and uh, their team. So they will continue the, the work. The data will be completed, and the analysis will be described. Um, I think that's will, and that shows uh, very much on discussion that all that will really draw us to what can we 
um, what can we see and can we uh, take from, from this uh, analysis in terms of uh, uh, new trial design, future trial design. And again, you know, mention has been done by Wim at the point about what would be the ideal piece of the phase to C type of uh, uh, data phase, of uh, trial phase within the development of uh, regimen uh, for TB treatments. So once the, the analysis will be described, uh, there will be papers, of course, being published, and we all look forward to seeing these papers. But uh, uh, discussing with CPTR, uh, WHO CPTR is thinking of uh, having a meeting, a co-sponsored meeting, um, within the, the year uh, to try and, and reflect still one more, fa uh, one further step on the learnings, those ones that have been communicated to uh, all of you today and further to come, and try to think more again in terms of future trial design based on uh, attempts that are being uh, done uh, in the area all, all over the place. So, in, in my, you know, uh, speaking about uh, the idea of the step uh, type uh, data uh, trial uh, the, that uh, Patrick uh, uh, has been, uh, um, that's a paper that you published recently, I think, huh? uh, the, so the phase to see data, etc. So I think that there is much to be gained on that, and uh, Deborah and I, we would like really to uh, try and have a focused discussion on that. So we are thinking of a WHO CPTR sponsored uh, meeting on that. And of course, we look forward to, as I say, the publication of the meetings. So we are about to close, but before closing, I really would like to have uh, at least uh, the opportunity for the members of the panel to express if there are any comments or anything they would like to, uh, to say before closing. I wanted to just say that <clears throat> one of the articles in the New England Journal series on data sharing talked about data dumpsters. Data? And how data dumpsters, where you just dump data, yeah. and how they're not useful. Um, and so I just wanted to take the last comment, or if others haven't, fine, but to acknowledge the huge effort this has required by um, all the parties involved, that you've converted trials data that you'd think simply would all fit into each other very nicely, and brought it into um, a data set that's uh, usable and analyzable, and then to recognize Rada, Marjorie, because just because you have the data doesn't mean you're going to get these kinds of outputs from them. Mm. Um, so it takes the right team to take it on. So a little gra gratitude and acknowledgement from there. Thanks, Brad. And Thank maybe I can much. just make one final comment regarding to that because I just uh, have this opportunity. Um, just from the data analysis point of view, um, and uh, often we run the trial and we run stat analysis and there's a lot of pressure, you want to see your results. But I really think that uh, I've been in many analysis involved and often the results come too late because uh, primary reanalysis already came out and you're moving, moving forward. Um, just I think that investment into good analysis and a multiple analysis uh, should be um, elevated compared to what we have now because I think only from the extensive analysis, which you do have some time to do, um, can actually get a lot of learning. So this is, um, if, there's, if I have one plea, is like at least whenever we plan something forward, uh, to really plan a lot of, um, not a lot, but more time and more uh, force in the analysis because we, we invested a lot of time generating those data, so we really want to get the most out of them. Uh, and that also takes time and brain power and effort. Thank you very much. Yes, yeah. uh, Amina. I just want to say very <coughs> quickly that what I'm saying now, you may think it's nothing to do with CPATH or CPTR, but I would like to submit that it has everything to do with CPATH and CPTR. And that is what happens before you get the data. And that, and there is a lot, I can tell you there is a lot of pain before you get that data. First, there are this looking for funding. Both Rifaquin and Rifashore trial were rejected at one time, the first time. Second time around, nothing had changed, they were approved. So what happened? A year passed and that trial could have been done earlier. Secondly, getting the approvals is getting longer and longer and very much more complicated. And I get the impression that the ethics committees, the approval committees, are watching their backs more than the patients' backs. More pain there. Thirdly, the president of a country decides he's going to help himself to your funds because he has to pay his army. I'm not making that up. That happens. So then 
you arrive at the end of the, the your time period, your trial is not completed, and you have no money, so you go back to the donors and they say, okay, <laughs> you can have a no-cost extension. What on earth? I don't need, an, I need money. <laughs> and as I say, it takes an awful lot of pain to bring these results to you people, and I think that you should be looking at it and, and how to make it easier for us. It's getting very, very much harder. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amina. The, the point is taken, and I think that uh, all of us here who have been doing and are, who are still doing trials know about the difficulty to, uh, to get uh, all that uh, started initiating and being conducted uh, in the field. Thank you very much. So if there is no uh, other comment, I would like really to thank the panel. Um, and thank you very much for the very, very vivid and lively discussion. Uh, thank you for the audience. I would like also to thank the Gates Foundation uh, because they, they have been allowing us to uh, create this whole uh, reflect uh, uh, project, a consortium, thinking about uh, the data and, and uh, the future. So without them, of course, we wouldn't have been able to, uh, to carry out that. So thanks again, Jan and Dave, for your wisdom in uh, helping us. And uh, thank you for listening. Uh, uh, and this is now uh, back to you for new trials and best way to try and test for new regimens so that we can have better treatment. Thank you very much. Thank you.